So a brief recap of our study so far, uh, and, and the point of the recap is, and I, I hope you've been seeing this, as we go through these points, these petals on this most beautiful flower in God's garden, it's not like there are four isolated points, or five isolated points, but rather there's a way that we move from one to the other that, that it's designed to paint a picture for us of the sovereignty of God as it relates to us and how it is that we get saved and what that looks like. So kind of the process that we, we've been on or the, the study, the journey we've been on so far as we've looked at the fact that people are totally depraved, so ravaged by sin that we can't come to God, we can't do anything that pleases Him, we can't save ourselves, we can't pull any good work together in and of ourselves and our own ability. So then we have God who knows and loves certain people before they exist and determines that he is going to save them and bring them into relationship with his son. And so he sends Jesus, who dies on a cross, not for everyone, but for the sins of those whom God loved and knew before and elected unto salvation. That there wasn't this gamble, there wasn't God saying, let me just kind of throw out this open invitation and see who accepts, but a very intentional, focused, Atonement, that Jesus wasn't a potential Savior. He was an actual Savior. And last week we looked at the fact that through the atonement, through what was accomplished on that cross, that when God looks and knows and loves and elects someone, he regenerates that person. So he gives them a new heart and new desires and, and gives them spiritual life from death. And both the regeneration that he gives them and his special specific call to follow him and trust him secures or guarantees that a person will respond in faith. And the language that Jesus uses in John 6.44 is no one can come to me unless the Father who sent him draws me and I will raise him up on the last day. The word draws there is not like coerces. Not like leaves a trail of breadcrumbs and says, listen, you come, let me try to convince you. But rather, the Greek there is more like compels, or the, the way that word is used in antiquity is when you would draw water from a well. Now, the cup doesn't go down and try to convince the water to jump in. It doesn't coerce it, saying it's better up here than it is down in this dark, cold well. But the cup scoops up the water and draws and brings it definitively out of the well. And so that's what we looked at last week, that when God calls us in some way, in some paradoxical way, he secures our willing choice to have faith and follow him, but it is determined and there is no alternative. His call is effective. Now, that leads us to our study tonight, which is the last petal on this flower, which is this. Can a believer... Someone who, once totally depraved and separate from God, called by him, elected by him, that the atonement applied to him, that God regenerates this person's heart, calls him, the person responds in faith, can such a person say definitively once and for all, I'm done with you God, and essentially lose their salvation? That's the question of tonight. After everything that God do, does, can a person then say, this is great, I don't want this anymore. With all of my heart, no longer do I desire a relationship with you. And that box saved, he manages somehow to erase. And now he goes from a, so like one day, if he dies today, I'm going to go to heaven. And then the next day he says, I'm done with this. Erases that, and then he dies, and then he goes to hell. Like, is that possible? Is it possible for that to happen? To happen. So that brings us to the P in tulip, which is perseverance of the saints. Now this again can be a misleading title, because it almost makes it seem like it is the saints who do the persevering. That we are the ones who will persevere and determine in and of ourselves that we're going to make it happen. So that's why, like all of the the letters, I've, I've been offering what a lot of theologians use as... As, as phrases that, that capture the idea better, um, many prefer preservation of the saints, that they are preserved by God. 
that they don't persevere in and of themselves, but rather it's God who pres- preserves them for salvation. Now, preservation of the saints, I'll, I'll get into this a little bit more at the end, but I want to say up front, uh, is important for, uh, for a number of reasons. Is very important for a number of reasons. Number one, it wraps up well the doctrines of grace. Because once we get through what we're done tonight, then there should be established in the heart and mind of a believer a safety and a security in the sovereign election, calling, and maintaining of the Lord in the life of a person. It kind of wraps it up well and says, He's God, He's in control, He's got me, and that makes me feel safe and gives me great joy and peace. So it does that. Number two, the doctrine of preservation of the saints is so closely related in principle, to irresistible grace, that it strengthens that and vice versa. So, if one is not true, then the other also cannot be true. And I'm going to explain why that is. That if, that they strengthen one another in in, in their kind of, in, in the principle of the doctrine. And then finally, it points to the power and faithfulness of God and what it does is it takes our eyes off of ourselves. It takes our eyes off, off of what we have to do and our strength and what we're required, and then it lifts it up to the Father that He is faithful. He is powerful. He is able. So, right away, I will give you a definition, an understanding of what uh, perseverance of the saints is. All those who are truly born again will be kept by God's power and will persevere as Christians until the end of their lives or until Christ returns. And that only those who persevere until the end have truly been born again. All those who are truly born again will be kept by God's power and will persevere to the end of their lives and that only those who persevere until the end have been truly born again. So there, there's two parts to this definition we're going to look at. And the first one is this. We can be sure of our salvation, that God has saved us. We can be sure that He has done what He has done. And number two, we can be sure of our eternal security, that He's not just saved us now, but his salvation, his saving work will last and will be maintained and will apply to us until the end of our lives. So what we need to do first is we need to look at an understanding or we need to talk about the doctrine of what many call biblical, um, the doctrine of eternal security or assurance of salvation. We need to talk about that briefly. So the Bible teaches that we can be assured of our salvation. The Bible doesn't say that as a believer we need to wake up every morning and ask questions like, am I really saved? Did he really save me? Was it a, really leg- was it a legitimate um, you know, confession of faith and faith response to him? If I die, is it going to be like, the believer doesn't have to and should not be living a life where we're constantly asking these questions. The scriptures say we can be sure that he has saved us and that his salvific work is effective and permanent that God has made us born again, and that we indeed are His. And so I want to look at a couple passages. The first one is 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 and 12. This is what the Apostle writes here. Therefore, brothers... Be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. Other translations will say, make your calling and election sure. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. Talk about what that means in a sec. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of those qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. So what Peter is saying here 
is that we can be sure and we can be diligent in confirming the fact that our election and calling is sure, that he has saved us, that he has called us, that he will maintain us, and that because of that we will never fall. Now, never fall there doesn't mean we'll never sin. It means we will never fall away from being saved. That we will never fall away from this calling and election, which is indeed sure, because we know what we have is an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying here. This is the uh, next blank in your notes. The Spirit gives us evidence and affirms that we have been saved. So there is a way that the Holy Spirit affirms in us that we indeed have been saved and we can be sure and secure of our salvation. Uh, in 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 to 6, this is what John writes. And by this we know that we have come to know him, that's Jesus, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Now there's two things here that John's saying. The first one is this, there is a way to know that we are in him. There is a way that we can know and we can perceive in a discerning way of those around us. Now, I'm not saying we're going around judging everyone's state of salvation, but there is a way, and it's clear in the New Testament, despite everyone misquoting, don't judge, you know, don't judge lest you be judged, totally misquoting what Jesus was really getting after. But there is a way biblically, especially elders and leaders of a church, but believers as well, need to discern based on what we see in the lives of others, is this person really in the faith? Right? Like this person says they're in a faith, and they are perpetual liar, adulterer. They don't, they're not remorseful over their sin. There just seems this growing, growing movement into disobedience. And yet this person says they're a believer. That doesn't make sense. We're called to discern that so that we might call the person on and say, hey, I've noticed an inconsistency here. Let me understand it. But John is saying there is a way that we can know that we are in him. Now that's great. But here's the challenge. The way, that we are, the way that we know that we are in him is the degree to which we obey his commands and pursue him and follow him. And Jesus says that in John's gospel. Why do you call me Lord? You don't do what I say. right? If you love me, you'll do what I say. Or in John 15, he says, abide in my love. If you obey my commandments, you will abide in my love. He's not saying if you obey my commandments, I will love you. He's saying obedience to my commandments shows that indeed you are abiding in my love. So we can be sure that he has saved us. And one of the ways that we can, in a self-litmus test way, know and be certain that he has saved me are things like this. And this is the first question. And this is, oh, for me, this is always the question that I either ask or in my mind I'm processing as I'm hearing someone talk about their Christianity. Do I have sincere affection for Christ? Do I, do I love him? Do I want to know him more? Does the idea of finding out more about who he is in his word excite me more than make me go, eh, whatever. I mean, sure, I guess that's kind of neat. Do I have affection for him? Do I know him? Is he changed? Do I love him? Do I presume? When I read things like Philippians 3, when Paul says, everything is rubbish compared to knowing and having him. Oh, that I would know him and share in his sufferings and, and, and have him more. Like, when we read something like that, do we go, uh-huh, yeah, yeah, that resonates with me. Or do we read something like that and say, eh, indifferent. So that's the first self-litmus test. Do I have sincere affection for Christ? The second one is this. Do I desire obedience to his commands for his glory and my joy? That's the difference. Because there are many people who say, I desire to obey the commands of God. Why? Well, because that's what's going to get me into heaven. Or that's what puts me in his good books. Or that's what a good Christian does. That's a different answer than, I obey the commands as I know the commands of God are designed to lead me into deeper joy. That he has a fullness of life for me 
that is found in obedience to his commands. So I joyfully obey him. That's why David says, I love your law. I sit up in bed in the middle of the night and I think upon your precepts because he knows that the commands of God are for his joy. And again in John 15, that's why Jesus says, these things I have commanded you, these things being obey me, pursue me, bear fruit, these things I have commanded you, why? So that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Right, so do we desire to obey the commands of Christ because we know that his commands are for our joy and for his glory? And then finally, this, and this is, this is, a, this is a good one that I think if we examine our lives, this should be something that should make us sure he has saved me. Do we see a pattern of growth and sanctification in our lives? Now notice I, I haven't said, have we stopped sinning? That is a terrible way to judge whether or not we are legitimately saved because no one's saved if that's the bar. The bar is, if I look at the last five years of my life, if I look at my life since he saved me, do I see growth towards sanctification? So, do I see that language that is cutting and sarcastic and hurtful? He's been working on that. It's not as bad as it was three years ago. Do I see that the the hold that certain sins would have over me, gossip or lust or lying, they don't have the same hold that they did five, ten years ago. Right? Do I see that my understanding of him and my sanctification has it grown? Because if we say, okay, I believed or I got saved five years ago, and in those five years it's actually been exactly the same or God help us, worse, that should raise some concern in the life of a person. But if we see this pattern, and it doesn't mean like we're just, we're like flying up, but we see there is growth. Maybe it's slow, maybe it's painful, but we do see, yeah, he's been working on me. I see he's been working on me. I'm not the same that I was five years ago, ten years ago. These are ways that we can know and be certain he has saved me. He has saved me. I don't have to doubt that he saved me. I don't have to wake up and say, is it all a lie? Am I going to show up at heaven and he's going to say, depart from me for I never knew you? Like, these should not be concerns for a legitimate believer. We can be sure of our salvation. Now the question coming out of that, leading into the remainder of our study, is this. Even though, that I, even though I can be sure I'm saved right now, today, at this moment, can I still lose my salvation? Can I go from a position of being saved to being unsaved? Can we, and this is some of the language people use, can we fall away? Can we backslide? Can we turn away from Jesus? Now, I'm going I'm to make a bold statement here, and uh, I, I don't think I'll get a lot of flack in this setting, but I'll, I'll say this anyway. There is one section in the Scriptures, three verses, and only three verses, that apparently seem to defend the idea that one can lose their salvation. Let me be clear. Nowhere else in the Bible. Nowhere. You, beginning to end, everything speaks against, except for these three verses. So upon these three verses has been mounted the defense of you can lose your salvation. So we need to look at these three verses, and we need to understand what they're really saying, And like I've said, and you will hear me say for as long as you're with me, you're going to hear me say this over and over and over and over and over and over again. In studying and understanding the scriptures, context and reading around what's happening is so important. It changes entirely how we understand verses. Context is so important, which is why you'll never hear me preach from one verse. And that's it. Here's our popcorn verse, and Jesus wants to understand the scriptures in their context. So we're going to look at this because, again, this is it. This is the only substantial argument against eternal security and and, uh, perseverance of the saints. And it is found in the book of Hebrews, which I find so ironic because the book of Hebrews seems to affirm over and over again the maintaining power of Christ to hold us to the end. But, I mean, anywho. um, Hebrews chapter 6 verse 4 to 6. 
This is what I have called the Hebrews issue. It's the issue in, in this, this letter that is, that is problematic, maybe, for eternal security, pres- uh, preservation, perseverance of the saints. So Hebrews 6, 4-6. to six, For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. So, other than that stuff in the middle, let me read the beginning and read the end and put together the actual the idea here. It is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, if they've fallen away, to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding them up to contempt. Now, let me say right off the bat, we can't take this verse literally in that it actually means what it says. And here's why. The verse says that someone who does fall away can never come back. Now, here's the problem with that. Number one, examples in the scriptures. Like Peter. Peter's a great example of someone who flat out denied Christ. And many, I mean, some will say, oh, maybe he was disobedient. I can make a clear argument that at that moment, Peter valued his safety above and beyond honoring Christ, and at that moment he lost it. Even Jesus himself said to Peter before he died, Peter... Satan is Satan wants you. He's coming after you. He wants to sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you. And when I restore you, strengthen your brothers. So even Jesus, maybe he's saying to Peter... So the first problem is biblical examples of people who may have seemed to have lost it and then come back. Or this idea of the scriptures say there is only one sin for, for which there is no forgiveness. And that sin is blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Now, this isn't... We could do a whole sermon on what blaspheming the Holy Spirit is. I wrote a paper on it. But, but here, essentially, this is it. Blaspheming the Holy Spirit is not a single sin, rather a lifestyle or attitude that attributes the things of God to the things of the world or the devil. So doesn't give praise to God for who he is and what he's done and rather will say things like, well, he's casting out demons in the name of Satan. Right? Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is not a sin that you can commit as much as it is a way that a person lives. And Jesus rightfully says, if a person is living in this way, then yeah, there's no repentance available for them. How can they be forgiven for for living a life of unrepentance? So, the scriptures say there is no sin for which there is no forgiveness except for a lifestyle sin, and yet here, Hebrews is saying, well, there is one sin that there's no forgiveness for. The sin of losing your salvation, which, I don't know if that's really... It just, to take this literally raises problems. It raises problems because what this means is we're essentially saying to someone, so your son or daughter who was of the faith and who walked away, stop praying for them. What do you mean stop praying for them? What do you mean stop praying they will come back? Well, Hebrews says they ain't coming back. There's no restoration for them. Wait a minute. That seems so counter to how we understand God. So I don't think we can take this literally. But that's that's a little part of the issue. It also stands in clear contrast to the rest of the scriptures. Now, we're going to look at a number of verses later. But I'm convinced that the scriptures clearly teach that when God gets you, he's got you. And he ain't never letting you go. That's the clear teaching of the scriptures. So, here we have one verse that seems to say the opposite. And so what we need to do, and this is, this is also a, little, a rule that I think is good and healthy for uh, studying the Bible and exegesis. If you have 20, 30 verses or, or passages that seem to reinforce a certain idea, and then over here you have one passage that seems to reinforce a different idea. This is the wrong thing to do. Take the one passage, hold it over the 30, and say, I think we need to redefine the 30. That is, what we need to do is take the 30 passages, which is obviously 
the more weighty, clear teaching, hold it over the one and say, what are we missing here? What are we missing here? Because it can't be that this one's right and then God's been lying or incorrect in all these other areas. So, so number one, I, we can't take it literally to mean that it says what it says because that raises problems theologically. Number two, I believe it's in clear opposition to the many, many, many passages in the Bible. And number three, so, 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 there's no number three. I lied. I just, I always think in three, so I just naturally went there. Um, so what does it mean? That's the number three. Number three, what does it mean? How do we understand Hebrews 6, 4 to 6? There are two uh, interpretations or ways to understand Hebrews 6, 4 to 6 that are A, um, biblically consistent, and B, fit within the context of Hebrews, that are a better way to understand it than you can fall away, lose your salvation, and you can never come back again. The first one is this, that the writer of Hebrews is taking an argument to its logical conclusion and extreme in the form of hypothetical. What do I mean by that? Uh, in 1 Corinthians fifteen fourteen, the Apostle Paul says, If Christ had not been risen from the dead, then your sins are not forgiven and your faith is in vain. Now, the Apostle Paul is not legitimately saying, well, Christ hasn't been risen. He's saying if. Imagine hypothetically that we can take this idea all the way to its conclusion, that idea being Christ really wasn't risen from the dead, then in kind of this extreme hypothetical, well then obviously if he hadn't, then your sins are, you're still in your sins and you're in vain. So one interpretation of this passage, which um, could be, is that the writer here is doing the same thing. He's saying, okay, imagine a situation where someone indeed could lose their salvation. Let's just imagine that's a possibility. It really isn't. But let's imagine it is. In that kind of a place where someone could indeed walk away, then for such a person, there'd be no way they could come back. Because they, like you said, they'd be crucifying Christ all over again. So that's one possibility. That he's taking an argument to its extreme conclusion in the form of a hypothetical. Could be that. The second one is this. That the those that he is speaking of are not legitimate believers, but rather those who are a part of the visible church. I want to read a passage in 1 John that helps give uh, some understanding to this before I kind of delve into that particular interpretation a little bit more. 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. They, so here John is speaking about people who at one point were with them involved in ministry and relationship, but now we're not. They went out from us, but they were not of us. If they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. So what's John saying there? He's saying that you can have people who were with him in his work. They were involved in the ministry that he was doing. Maybe they were teaching. Maybe they were actually serving. And John's saying they may have looked like they were with us or they were of us but they weren't of us. And here's how we know they walked away. So John is not saying they were legitimately of us and then they walked away. He's saying they were never of us. And here's why we know they were never Christians, because they walked away. Them walking away from Christ is evidence that they were never in Christ to begin with. That's what John's saying here. Or the, the kind of cute little poem about salvation is if you got it, You'll never, you, never lose it, and if you lose it, you never had it. That's what John is saying here. So here's, here's, an, here's the other interpretation of this Hebrews passage. You have those who are a part of the visible church. They're attending a church. Maybe they're serving. Maybe they're singing. Maybe they're professing to be believers, but they're a part of this church. And so then we can begin to look at the different ways that the writer of Hebrews describes their involvement he, sa uh, he says, who have once been enlightened. Well, obviously they've been enlightened. They've sat under the teaching of the word. 
that they've heard the truth, they've heard the gospel, they've been given information that has enlightened them in that they know cognitively the truth that they wouldn't have known otherwise. And then he says, who have tasted the heavenly gift. Well, by being a part of a church, that when God so graciously blesses his people with his presence in worship, uh, in, in relationship, that there's a way that by simply being in that place, by default, you taste the gift, or you are at least involved in what's happening here. Who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who've tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come. So they have been a part of and seen and experienced, kind of from a distance a little bit, the goodness and power of God in the church. Now that is a very good way to describe someone who is maybe a part of a church, the visible church, but isn't really saved. Yeah, there's been a way that they have been a part of and experienced and seen the goodness and the power of God. They've sat under the teaching of the Word. They've been a part of the means of grace, the Word, the Lord's Supper, baptism. And so maybe what the writer of Hebrews here is saying, for such a person who never really was saved to begin with, if they fall away or assume they leave the church and then say, not for me, it was all a big lie anyways. Obviously, there's no coming back for them. Well, unless, of course, they repent, in which case they're no longer that person who's living a double life. So that might be another interpretation. I'll be honest with you. I would not be willing to die for either one of these interpretations. Like, I'm not going to put my stick in the ground and say, it is this one, it is this one. I'll be honest. I don't fully know. Like, I'm not prepared to draw a line but I'm convinced that either one of these understandings of Hebrews 6, 4 to 6, are, are good. Are good and make sense biblically and contextually. And it has to be one of those because it clearly cannot be that those who are legitimately saved can fall away and lose it. Again, the rest of the scriptures clearly teach that that is not the case. So, I wanted to spend a little bit of time in there because if... If your experience is going to be like my experience, when I start talking with people about what I believe in this idea of you can never, when he's got you, he's got you. You're not losing it. What about Hebrews 6, 4 to 6? They might not be able to quote it exactly like that, but what about that passage that says it's impossible for those who fall away that they'll never come back? That I want to be able to educate and equip you to say, well, it can't really mean that, right? Because there's a lot of problems with that. But here's what it could mean. So, so one, to, to kind of strengthen our understanding of the doctrine, but two, to be able to equip you to say, how do I deal with someone who's going to throw that my way? All right. So other than that one instance or example in the scriptures, how do we understand the rest of the scriptures? So I'll argue again. I think the Bible clearly teaches, clearly teaches the doctrine of perseverance of the saints of eternal security. So we're going we're gonna to go through a few verses um, and I won't, I won't take too long in these verses. Uh, John chapter 6, start in verse 37. We'll go down to verse 40. I also read a chunk of this last week when we looked at um, Irresistible Grace. And, and actually, a lot of what I'm going to read uh, are sections that are connected to what I read last week. And, and this is why I said, and I'll talk about later, the doctrine of perseverance of the saints is so cl- is so linked, so 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 powerfully connected to irresistible grace that they hold each other up. And in principle, one proves the other true. And if one's not true, the other also isn't true. John six thirty seven. This is Jesus speaking. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. So here Jesus is saying, everyone God gives me is coming to me, and I'll never say no to them. But some might ask, okay, but what if Jesus says yes, and then we walk away anyways? Okay, well, let's look at verse 38. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Verse 39, and this is the will of him who sent me. Here we go. That I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, 
that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Period. That's it. I would drop this microphone right now if I could, and it wouldn't make a terrible sound on the recording. Like, I don't understand. Like, right there, that's it for me. But we're gonna do we're gonna do four or five more. But that to me is is a clear, clear teaching that Jesus is saying, once the Father gives you to me, you're in. You're in, and nothing and no one is gonna change that. But let's 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 keep going on. There might be people who are listening to the rec- recording and are like, mm, just one verse. Well, well, let's let's go. John chapter ten, uh, verse twenty seven to thirty. My sheep, again, this is Jesus speaking, if you don't have Red Letter Bible. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. You see irresistible grace again. I give them eternal life, look at this, and they will never perish, and even better, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them. Out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. So when someone says, I can lose my salvation, I can walk away from Jesus, I say, no one can snatch you out of the Father's hand. And listen, you're a part of that no one. Jesus didn't say no one except for yourself. He said no one, including you. No person ever. No one can ever snatch you out of the Father's hand, including yourself, even though you're a wretched, miserable, sinful, fallen person. Even you can't snatch yourself out of the Father's hand. No one. Powerful, powerful promise from Christ to hold on to us. Let's go over to Romans chapter 8. Verse 28 and 30. We've read this pretty much every week, because this is what theologians call the great chain of salvation that touches on, essentially, um, not so much all of, but at least four of the five points of the doctrines of grace of this most beautiful flower. Romans 8, verse 28 to 30. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, all things working together for good. Verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. So he knows them, he loves them, he predetermines to save them and make them like Jesus, in order that that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And all of those that he knows, that he foreknows and that he predetermines, all of them he calls. And all of those that he calls, he justifies, that they respond in faith and he makes them righteous and innocent in the sight of God. And this is where it is here. And those whom he justified, he glorified. So every single one of those, known, loved, elected, called, justified by God, he will take to heaven. They're going there. He's working on them. He's making them more and more glorious until one day they stand in glory, perfected, ain't losing one of them. There's not a sense that he's like all of them except for maybe the really, really bad ones. He'll glorify. All of them will be glorified. All of them. Ephesians. Flip over to Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 3 to 14. This is a lengthier one, but I was was sitting as I was studying. I'm like, can I break this up? I I can't. It's It's all really, really good. And it's all there. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Like just, okay, let's just stop there for a second as a side note. Think about that verse. Every spiritual blessing that exists in the heavenlies, which we've got to figure out what those are, but wherever they are, all of them, we have been blessed with in Christ Jesus. That's kind of massive. I I think that's pretty incredible. Um, Let's keep going. Even as he chose us in him, before the foundation of the world. So he chose us, but for what? That we should be holy and blameless before him. 
In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he sent forth in Christ. Look at verse 10. As a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth, that there is a way that we will be reconciled to him. Those that he has called and elected will be reconciled to him once and for all. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So you believe, you respond in faith to the goodness and grace and mercy of God. He gives you his Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance. So the Holy Spirit given to the believer is God's way of saying there is something, there is an inheritance that, and the inheritance here, I don't want to get into this, but the inheritance here is not that we get an inheritance, but that we are Christ's inheritance. So Jesus lives a perfect life, dies on the cross, and God looks at that and says, because of your obedience, I have an inheritance for you. And that inheritance is the people that I have called and elected. They are yours. You will see. So, so here Paul is saying that we indeed are his inheritance and that God has given us his Holy Spirit to show us, to confirm that Christ indeed purchases us and saves us and we're in his inheritance. But look, until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So those who are called, who are saved, who are given the Holy Spirit, confirming that we are Christ's, we have that until we acquire possession of it, which happens when we die and are in glory with him. So he's, he's saying here, those of us who believe, who've been given the Spirit, he's taking us into glory. And he's given us the Holy Spirit to show us that this is going all the way to the end. Just a few more here. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. I, I followed up the longest one with the shortest one. But it just also happened to be in order. I didn't plan it that way. Philippians 1, six, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. That the one who called you and saved you, he will hold you until the day of Christ, until he comes back or you die. And then finally, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8 to 12. I, I really, really like this, uh, this little section here in, in 2 Timothy. I remember I taught on it one time at the retreat, and I was, I was getting all fired up. I really, really like this. 2 Timothy 1, 8 to 12. So he's writing to Timothy. Paul is saying, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. Here we go. Verse 12. I love this. But I am not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. And I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. I'm not ashamed of him to follow him, to love him, to tell others, to preach him, to live for him. Why? Because I'm convinced that he's going to guard for me what has been entrusted to me on that day. That he's given me his spirit, that he has saved me, and he's going to be able to hold that until the day I stand before him. And the Apostle Paul is convinced of that. And so he's not ashamed. 
So the question is not, can I lose my salvation? And when people ask that question, can I lose my salvation? This is the question I ask in its place. Can he lose you? Can he lose you? Forget about you. Yes, of course you can lose your salvation. Can, yes, if it were up to me, I'd lose it. The answer to that question is yes. If it's on you, you are losing your salvation. You're probably losing it 30 seconds after you got it. If you can make it 30 seconds. That's how long is it? Of course you can. That's not the question that the scriptures address. The question the scriptures address is, can he lose you? That when he's got you, and says, I've loved you and known you since before you existed. I've called you. I've saved you. I've brought you in. And now I have you here. Can that God lose us? Can he like, whoa, is he like, is, he, is, is, is God doing that relay race where he's trying to run with the egg on the spoon and he's just trying to get there as fast as he can? Oh, I got it right. Oh, right. Is, that, is that the picture that we have of God? who's trying to hold on to us, like, is he going to do it? Is he going to make it? Right, like we're all in suspense. Is she going to make it? No. No, obviously, he can't lose us. He tells us he's not going to lose us. He tells us no one's going to take us out of his hand. He tells us, I will hold on to you until the end. Over and over and over and over again in the scriptures. In Psalm 32, and it says, The Lord preserves his saints to the end. No, no, he can't lose us. He can't. He is too powerful and too faithful and too sovereign to lose us. And we are far too weak to wiggle ourselves out of his hand. Like we're going to pry ourselves through his fingers. I made it. Ah, I lost my. Like. No, no, this is not the God that we see in the scriptures. And this is one of the reasons why I I said again, this doctrine strengthens the doctrine of irresistible grace. Because if it is up to me, if I am the final authority on whether or not I get saved, and maintain my salvation, I'm losing it every single time. And you, like, I think that the healthiest way to live as a believer is to live with the assumption that if it's up to me, I'm going to fail. Just like, just live, like, please, live in that for the rest of your life. That if it's on me, I'm failing. If it's on me, I'm going to lose it. If you just, you just, you just say that to yourself, that if it's on me, I got no shot then that's just going to drive you to trust that he's good and that he's faithful and realize that it's not about you, it's about him, that he's the one that holds on to you. Right? The same God who can secure our faith response, the same God who secures it once he has us, he has us until the end. Otherwise, again, God's some guy up there rolling the cosmic dice, just hoping that he gets seven every time, hoping he doesn't get a, a snake eyes and then, oh, I lost another one. Oh, we're like... That is not the God of the scriptures. He's not hoping he's going to hold on to us. He's not saying, listen, I'm trying. Like he never says in the scriptures, listen, son, daughter, I'm trying real hard here to hold on to you. I'm giving it my best. I'm I'm, I'm giving it 110% to just hold on to you. No, he says, I got you. You're mine. No one's going to take you out. No one's going to pull you away. You're You're not losing it. I have you. Secure. I got you. That's the God of the Scriptures. That's a promise for him. And so the only question that remains, as with every week, is why does this doctrine matter? Okay, Andrew, again, that, that's great. All right, perseverance of the saints. Why does this actually matter? Like, what's the... And I would hope that in the course of the last little bit as I've been up here teaching, you've hopefully caught glimpses of why this matters. But let me reiterate again briefly why this matters. First... Because it points to the power and the faithfulness of God. It takes our eyes off of ourself. Because again, if it's up to us, we fail. We lose it every time. It takes our eyes that we look at Him. That He's powerful. That He's able. 
and we worship him and we praise him and we thank him that when he says, no one will take you out of my hand. Man, no one's going to take us out of his hand. Not even you. Not even dumb old me. Not even stupid, sinful, wretched me is going to be able to pull myself out of his hand. That is how powerful the grip of God is upon my soul and my salvation. That I can't even undo it. I can't even undo it. And listen, I'm thankful I can't undo it. Can we just can we agree on that? I'm thankful that I can't say, I don't want this anymore. Because I'm, I'm probably sure I would say that from time to time if, I, if it were on me. So I'm thankful that I can't lose it. Okay? He's not a God who's hoping or wishing, but securing. Second, and, and I hope that you've caught this, this is tremendously encouraging for believers. Like this, this should, like you should just sit in this and be radiant in the reality that he's never letting you go. Never. Ne- he's not going to lose you. You're good in his hands. If you are his and he's called you and saved you, then he will hold on to you. Until the- That's encouraging. That's joy-giving and peace-giving and deep, substantial, satisfying to know he's never, never going to let me go. He's always got me. right? He's working all things together for my good. Yeah, because I love him, but why do I love him? Because he's called me according to his purpose. That's why I know he's working all things for my good. So this should increase our affection for him. This should make us thankful and praise him. Lord, thank you that you're much more faithful than I am. And that when you promise something, you hold to your promises. Unlike me, who breaks them all the time. Praise God that I'm not the one that's in charge of my salvation. Should be our response to eternal security. And so this is obviously good news. It's good news, and I've used this example before. Half of the cups of tea I, I, I pour, I spill some water on my hand. Like, we're talking pouring cups of tea I can't get perfectly. If my salvation were up to me, I'd have no shot. I'd have no chance to make sure that I got it right all the time. Surely I would lose it many, many, many times over. And so I'm thankful that his blood doesn't just cover me for a bit. That he doesn't die for me and atone for my sins just for a little while and then I say no thanks. But that the atoning work of his sacrifice covers me until I die and then carries me into glory. That it's enough to satisfy the demands of the Father as long as I have breath and even after he takes my breath back from me that he is, he is lent to me. That it pays for all my sins, past, present, and future. There is no sin throughout my entire life that has not been covered by the cross of Christ that the Father has not already looked over because he put it on the Son. Even what I'm going to do in 10 years, 20 years, Lord willing, 40, 50 years, all the sins I have before me, already paid for. Already paid for. In full, because of what Christ has done. And he secures my eternal state with him in glory. That's why this matters. That's why this matters. Because we are talking about who God is and the hope that we can have in him that he says that he is who he says he is, and that we can trust him. It matters. This doctrine matters. These doctrines matter. Now, we're not done here, as in, i got one week left next week, and what I want to do next week is I want to, um, in a, a deeper way, I want to spend a lot of time looking at practically how do these doctrines affect the way we live, the way we do life, the way we do ministry, the way we understand church and relationships in our lives, how is it that these don't just become these lofty concepts we study in a Bible study setting or that some guy talks about from a music stand, but I actually want to look at where, like how is it that these doctrines put feet on and move in reality so that it affects the way we live and how we understand our lives and relationship with God and our obedience to his commands. But that's next week. This week, I just want to close by saying these doctrines do matter, and they matter because it's who he is, and because I can be sure and certain 
that what he has secured for me, he's going to be able to maintain until I die or until he comes back.